Greetings. Um, this is lecture Q, the first part of temperature and heat. Um, please uh, take a look at the syllabus, particularly the rubric for your discussion sections. Be sure that they have more than 250 words in your post and your response. They're two different things. You each have 250 words or more. Um, some students are losing quite a bit of points unnecessarily, so just make sure you post um, with a significant amount of words and content and ideas and thoughts of expression, okay? Uh, so we're gonna talk about heat and temperature, temperature and heat. So before we get too much into this, um, let's review a little bit about the states of matter. Now we have solids, liquids, and gases, and the idea here is that uh, solids have uh, a certain vibrational motion associated with them. And remember that the degrees of freedom for a solid are quite limited. There's no flow or, or movement macroscopically of molecules over another. And a solid is fixed. If we have a cube sitting on the counter, it stays a cube. Now these molecules or atoms within the substance are just vibrating, but they're stuck in space. Uh, I wrote jiggle here, and you might even think about a piece of jello. So that's kind of your model for a solid. It, they just, the, the molecules or atoms within the substance uh, vibrate and they don't move or flow like liquid water does. Individual atoms or molecules in a liquid, say liquid water, uh, contain significant freedoms of motion. The three freedoms of motion are all available for liquid water, which is vibration, okay? Individual water molecules can be vibrating, okay? Uh, they can rotate. Think about my pencil here that's rotating. It's not moving, it's not vibrating, it's rotating, okay? So individual water molecules can rotate in many different um, orientations, and they can also translate, okay? Translation is just move, okay? But technically, these are all movements, okay? So translation is specifically when you move from one set of Cartesian coordinates to the other set of Cartesian coordinates without spinning or vibrating in, in the process, okay? So translation is just this type of movement. Rotation is this type of movement, and I can't vibrate this pencil but uh, vibration would be, you know, the jiggle movement, okay? So all of these uh, are happening in a gas as well, okay? Now we know we can uh, heat up solids to melt them to make them into liquids, and we can heat up liquids more to uh, evaporate them or vaporize them to produce gases, okay? So heat is intricately intertwined with the states of matter and transformations they undergo, okay? The transformations of states of, of uh, substances are called phase changes or state changes, okay? The important part is to realize that uh, molecules are moving and temperature is defined as the energy of motion, I like to say, okay? The temperature of a substance is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules making up the substance. So uh, that's kind of my cliff note explanation of it. Temperature is the energy of motion. Um, it's a measurement of the average kinetic energy of 
of the whole sample, okay? It's kind of an indirect measure, okay? Now, the thing I want to emphasize here is that if something's hotter, things are moving faster, okay? Okay, if you have a hot object, um, atoms are moving faster. So think about a cold piece of aluminum and a hot piece of aluminum that might hurt your hand or something. In the hot piece of aluminum, atoms or molecules are moving faster. How do I demonstrate this to students so they can wrap their minds around this? On a cold day, what do you do? You rub your hands together, okay? What's going on there? We talk about friction and how it's a resistance to flow. Of, of, of material sliding along a surface, okay? And so when you rub your hands together, what's happening? Okay, that's movement, right? That's movement, and you're transferring that energy of motion into the energy of motion of molecules. Now my hands feel warmer. The actual molecules in my skin that make up the oils and skin cells and everything like that are now moving faster. They're bumping and vibrating and all that kind of stuff more quickly. Uh, and so my hand senses, and the sensation of that is that it's warmth, okay? So atoms move faster in hot objects, and they move slower in cold objects. So once again, Temperature is energy of motion. This can be demonstrated with uh, your hands, okay? So, uh, let's now talk about uh, temperature a little bit. Temperature is a number, right? Like in this room, it might be 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or it might be, uh, you know, 18 degrees Celsius or something like that. And that's a relative measure of the hotness or coldness of an object. So I'm just going to say temperature reading here just to differentiate it from the previous description. In the nurse's object, you might get your uh, temperature taken. That's how hot or cold your body is, right? To try to figure out if you have a fever, for example. Um, if you measure the temperature of the air in out, outside your house, that might be for uh, determining the weather, okay? How hot or cold the weather is at that, at that moment, okay? The atmosphere. So this is, this is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about individual molecules in a sample. We're talking about more of a macroscopic object, okay? So when people uh, talk about this, um, they talk about the relative hotness or coldness of things like, wow, it's hot, wow, it's cold. Um, well, do you, do you have a number for that, okay? You need a temperature reading for you to be more exact, right? So we talked about scientific science, how it involves scientific measurements and how that uh, forms data, and it can go into different calculations or conclusions, okay? Um, now we have these things called uh, thermometers to measure temperatures, okay? So meter, we know, is uh, something that's used to measure. Thermo means heat, okay? We're familiar with a thermos bottle or a thermos. Uh, so a thermometer is basically a heat meter or something that reads the amount of heat in a substance. And that's not technically um, 
accurate. Okay, so this this the meaning of that word is not really correct. It doesn't measure heat, it measures temperature. There's a tremendous and very important distinction or difference between heat and temperature. Here we're just measuring temperature, okay? So really that should be temp meter or something, okay? So thermometers measure temperature, okay? That's the important uh, thing here, okay? Now we have many different types of uh, devices that are uh, devised to measure uh, temperature, okay? And we have different scales, all right? Let me show you uh, what the earliest thermometers looked like. Um, the earliest thermometers were made of uh, glass and they contained mercury. So this shiny metallic substance is liquid metal. It's called liquid mercury. And inside of this thermometer is a very thin capillary or a th very thin tube. If I turn it sideways, uh, you can't see it because of the reflection of the glass, but um, you can kind of see it uh, there's a small um, shiny metal object that goes up to here or so on the thermometer, and that's a you, you can't even you can't even see it on the video. Um, now the way this works is that when this is placed into a warm object, the metallic uh, liquid mercury expands a little bit, and so it flows up this tube. Okay, and so it can go up high here, and if you put this into a cold object. Uh, liquid mercury will contract and it will shrink and so the mercury will flow down the tube. So when, when they have that expression, the mercury is rising, that means that it's getting hotter because the mercury is heating up, it's expanding, it's being pushed up this small capillary tube and it's rising, okay? Uh, mercury is a toxic substance. If I were to break this thermometer, I'd have to carefully clean up the mercury and dispose of it as hazardous waste. So they've come up with uh, alcohol filled thermometers. Now there's a red dye in here. Normal alcohol doesn't doesn't look like this with the with a little red color here, but it's it's a kind of like think about red food coloring, okay? So there's red food coloring in here. And this operates on the same principle. When this is placed in uh, hot water, for example, the uh, alcohol in here will expand and it will push up this uh, capillary tube. And I think you can see the red little capillary a little bit better on this video. And these are more safe. If I were to drop this on the floor, I could just clean up the glass and clean up the alcohol with a paper towel or something, okay? So that's a um, alcohol-filled thermometer. Let me run to the back stock room and show you what a digital thermometer uh, looks like. Um, this is a digital thermometer and of course it has some functions over here like on off hold min max and uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius and there's a small blue wire that goes into this stainless steel tube here and I'll take this out so you can see what it looks like uh, on the very tip here we have a uh, thermistor <clears throat> and it's uh, it's, it's very hard to see. I, I don't even think you can see it on the camera, okay? But there's two wires here. I'm not sure if you can even see the two wires in the video. Yeah, you can't see it. So I'll spread them apart a little bit. There's the two wires and at the tip is a thermistor. It's, it's, it's sealed with a plastic covering and there's other stuff down there on the tip and wire, rubber wire, but basically it's a thermistor. Now we've talked about resistors before in the previous section, and a thermistor is something that varies its resistance based on temperature, okay? So if you put it into an object that's hot or you put it in an object that's cold, it's gonna have different resistance. And um, this is basically a fancy uh, meter that measures resistance. And there's a calculation in there to convert that to temperature, either Fahrenheit or Celsius. Okay, so a digital thermometer is more convenient for the um, 
you know, nursing office or other engineering applications, particularly for measuring extremely high or extremely uh, low temperatures where things will freeze. For example, mercury will freeze eventually or alcohol will freeze. And so if you wanna measure a very low temperature, you can use something digital. And if you need to measure something very high in temperature, there are limits because mercury will eventually, even mercury will boil, okay? Or evaporate or, or um, the glass will melt, for example, in a uh, thermometer. So I can put this into a flame and measure the temperature. And in theory, it shouldn't damage a carefully designed thermometer, okay? So that is a digital thermometer. So a couple different types, okay? Mercury, alcohol, and digital. And they each have their um, limitations and applications. As we discussed, mercury is toxic, okay? Alcohol is okay, but alcohol has a pretty low uh, boiling point, so you gotta watch out for that. And we have a digital thermometer. Digital thermometers are useful um, because they can be placed into uh, very high temperatures or very low temperatures, for example, okay? There are two temperature scales I wanna talk about. The Fahrenheit scale was developed in 1715 by a German physicist Gabriel D. Fahrenheit. And um, the Fahrenheit uh, scale is based off of uh, water, basically. Um, a bunch of lines were made on a thermometer, and then this was placed into ice water and it measured 32 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And then it was placed into boiling water and that measured 212 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? There are 180 different markings between these two, 180 uh, markings or degrees, okay? So these are degrees or spacings. So here, ice is going to melt at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Water will freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's called the freezing point of water. When something freezes, it changes from a liquid to a solid. Up here at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the boiling point of water. So if you're making uh, spaghetti noodles and there's a rolling boil there on your water and you're exactly one atmosphere pressure and there's no salt or anything, it's just absolutely pure, clean water, it will be at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So liquid water changes to steam or gaseous water at the boiling point, okay? So liquid changes to a gas, all right? It eventually just goes away, right? So that's the Fahrenheit scale, and that was, uh, you don't need to memorize it, but it was invented by somebody with the last name Fahrenheit, and it was in 1715, so that was, uh, um, you know, clo pretty close to 300 years ago. The invention of the thermometer opened up a lot of scientific advancements, um, and it was many, many different laboratory experiments involved measuring temperature, okay? That's the English system that's used. So if you set your thermostat at home to uh, 68 Fahrenheit or 70 Fahrenheit, or in the summer, maybe you turn on the air conditioning to 72 or something like that, that's all degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Degrees Fahrenheit is, is indicated with a little uh, circle and then an F, okay? The little circle on the upper left-hand corner is pronounced degrees and the capital, capital F is pronounced Fahrenheit. It's defined based on the boiling point and freezing point of water. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit.
water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So if somebody were to walk outside and say, whew, it's freezing out here, and you had a thermometer and you looked at it and it said 34 degrees Fahrenheit, you could technically say, no, it's not freezing. Freezing refers only to three, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? <clears throat> now, another question nurses and doctors like to answer or worried parents is if a kid has a fever or a patient has a fever, okay? And this is done also with a thermometer. Now, some people naturally just have a higher body temperature and, you know, maybe 99 degrees. And some people naturally might just have a lower body temperature, like, you know, 97 even degrees, okay? And this varies a little bit when you sleep. When you sleep, your body temperature goes down a little bit. So when somebody checks your fever, they usually um, want to see how high the fever is. You know, if you have four degrees, above body temperature, then that's a problem, okay? Now the average body temperature of all the human population is 98.6, so they consider that to be a normal body temperature, okay? But even then, some people uh, fluctuate or vary uh, um, depending on what they eat um, and a little bit on, you know, their, their physiology, okay? So body temperature, is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And basically, uh, if you have a temperature higher than that, you're gonna have a fever. And if you have a temperature lower than that, you're gonna be at a normal body temperature. So that's something to uh, look into here, okay? Um, 454. You know the book, uh, Fahrenheit 454, this is the temperature at which uh, paper will actually burn. So um, if you put a piece of paper in, the, in your oven at home at maybe 375, that won't burst into flame. But if you get it up high enough, again, it's gonna depend on the type of paper. But if you're above 454, like say 475 or 500, um, that paper can actually burst into flame. And if you read the book, you, you know what happens in the book. They burn a lot of books. So that's where that number comes from. That's the, um, the temperature at which paper will actually burn. But again, the Fahrenheit scale is just based on uh, the freezing point and the boiling point. Okay, okay. yeah, go ahead. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is uh, Celsius scale. Celsius scale is what we use in the science lab. And if you look at this thermometer, it might be hard to see on the video here. Um, there's a little C there. Uh, I don't think you can see it. Um, this one as well has a little C at the very top of the thermometer. And I believe you can just barely see it in the video there. That capital C means Celsius. On the digital thermometers, if I turn this on, um, the default here is degrees Celsius. So that little C where my pencil is pointing to is Celsius, okay? Now the Celsius uh, temperature scale was invented by Anders C. Celsius, a Swedish astronomer in about 1735, okay? So Celsius temperature scale was invented by somebody with last name Celsius. Uh, Celsius has a couple different uh, spellings, but usually it's the S that's a better spelling, okay? Okay, it can sometimes be C-E-L-C-I-U-S, but the, the last name of this individual was Celsius with an S, okay? So C-E-L-S-I-U-S, -S, okay? And this is the temperature scale. And you can consider this to be a, a metric unit. Technically it's not, but uh, it's what we use in the lab and so on and so forth, okay? Now, the way this thermometer I imagine was developed is that 
somebody didn't put a whole bunch of markings and number them before they put it into uh, ice cold water and boiling water, the way they did this thermometer is they first put it into ice cold water, okay? And they said, okay, that's the freezing point of water. We're gonna say that's zero degrees Celsius, okay? Then they stuck this thermometer into boiling water and very carefully measured the boiling point and they define that as 100, okay? So this is freezing point is defined at zero, boiling point is defined as 100 degrees Celsius. Next, they took a ruler and, you know, a, sh a Sharpie or something, and they, this is Celsius made 100, you know, divisions or 100 degrees between those two, okay? So remember a division is basically a degrees. So uh, it's just a slightly different scale, but again, it's based off the freezing point and boiling point of water. Now, what is normal body temperature? Normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Celsius. Now it's possible to have temperatures below zero, okay? Um, and there's just lines that go on below that, and then there's markings or degrees above 100, okay? So of course, um, lead, for example, is going to melt at a temperature higher than the boiling point of water, or your metal stainless steel pot is gonna melt at a temperature higher than the boiling point of water. And so, you know, it'd be, you know, maybe 1700 degrees Celsius or something like that. And your freezer obviously is designed to freeze ice cubes, so it's gonna have a freezing point below zero. Uh, freezing point of the freezer here in the lab runs at about minus 10 or minus 15 degrees Celsius, depending on when you catch it on the cycle, okay? Now you only need a temperature of zero degrees Celsius to freeze water but because you've got other things in there like juice or meats and stuff, um, the freezer is usually much below that just to make sure that everything remains solid, okay? So that's the temperature scale uh, that we generally use. Now the Kelvin scale, named after a British uh, person, uh, Different last name, but when they were knighted, they became Lord Kelvin, and so that's named after Kelvin. It's based on this idea of absolute zero. Absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature. When we talked about the speed of light, we may have uh, mentioned that that's the cosmic speed limit. There is nothing that can go faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, this is another uh, very hard speed limit. Uh, in the sciences, we can cool things down to very, very, very low temperatures, and we can try to get below this, but it seems like that's the limit. We can only cool to 0 0.00001 Kelvin, for example, and that's pretty much as you know, we can check, keep cooling and cooling and cooling, but we can never get to negative uh, Kelvin, okay? So that's what we call absolute zero. Absolute zero is zero Kelvin. I'll spell it out here because it looks weird on the board. So zero Kelvin, um, there's your zero, right? and Kelvin is capital K. That's how we abbreviate, abbreviate that. For Celsius, we abbreviate it with a uh, degrees C, and it's pronounced degrees Celsius, okay? Degrees Celsius. Kelvin does not have a degrees. 
it's very interesting, okay? Um, zero is the lowest achievable temperature, and that's approximately minus 273 uh, Kelvin. Now to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you just add 273 to the number there, okay? So let's do that as a practice problem here. Here we've got room temperature at 20.3, okay? Of course, that's not a definition of a room. It's just this room right now today is 20.3 degrees Celsius. And so you can do this in your head or, or use a calculator if you want. Um, you're gonna add these two numbers up together, okay? And you get 293. I, I guess I'll show the work in case you're not seeing how that comes about. So mathematically here on the left, this is what we get. T is equal to 293.3, or K is equal to 293.3. And uh, what you do want to do over here is write 293.3, and then um, use this unit, capital K here, all right? In the sciences, we always put the, the units after a number. Um, here, it looks very awkward to say K equals 293.3, right? If somebody said, how hot is it today? You wouldn't say F equals 68. You'd say it's 68 F or it's 68 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So that's how you convert from uh, Celsius to Kelvin. You have to add 273 to it, okay? So absolute zero is negative 273 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's an extremely cold temperature, and like I said, we've never achieved that. Okay. There's no limit in terms of how hot something can be. All right. So those are the three uh, temperature scales. The Kelvin scale is technically the metric unit for temperature, but in the lab we always measure it in degrees Celsius. Okay, that's just what we do. Um, Fahrenheit is used in the English system, usually with uh, body temperature, you know, uh, fever thermometers and weather, okay? And degrees Celsius is used in the lab all the time to measure temperatures of liquids, solids, whatever we're doing, okay? So neither of those scales is, is more accurate than the other, and they're both just, they just have arbitrary points that describe two points on the scale. And scientists have chosen to use water as the kind of universal substance that everybody has access to. And so zero is 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. And the boiling point is 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now what is heat? We've talked a lot about temperature. We've talked about thermometers and these different scales. And we've talked about the freezing point and boiling point of water. So what is heat? Now heat, um, think about if you had a uh, hot cup of soup or a hot coffee or something like that, and it was too hot, how would you cool that substance? So here's our hot cup of coffee. And you could do a couple things to make it cool. You could uh, just let it sit on the countertop and over time it will cool down or you could blow on it. And that causes air to move over the surface and somehow it'll change to a, a cooler cup of coffee, right? Now we call heat thermal energy and it's a form of energy. And the important thing about energy to really make sure you understand is that we've talked about matter. Matter cannot 
there's what we call conservation of matter. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. And the same thing goes for heat, okay? Heat can be transferred from one object to another, but it can't be created or destroyed, okay? So it's a type of energy. It's the energy of motion or the kinetic energy of molecules that it contains, okay? Now, as we'll see, um, heat is going to depend on the uh, quantity of substance as well, okay? I think we've all had the experience of boiling water to cook noodles or maybe macaroni, and we're th when we're throwing things in there, a drop of boiling water falls on your hand, and for a split second, you're like, ah, it hurts, okay? Now, if you were to spill that whole pot of boiling water on your hand, that would be a reason to go to the emergency room because that's a large amount of water, that's a large amount of energy, okay? So if we have a liter of water, let's say, and let's say it's really, really hot, maybe 85 degrees Celsius, compared with a small amount of water, let's say, a quarter liter of water at 85 degrees Celsius. These two have different amounts of thermal energy, okay? They have the same temperature, of course, because individual water molecules are perhaps moving in the same way. They have kinetic energy, they have energy of uh, rotation, translation, and maybe vibration, okay? if you were to look at an individual water molecule. But if you look at the whole sample now, we can see that this is a much larger content, so there's a lot more energy there, okay? So thermal energy is gonna depend on temperature and on amount. Okay, so it depends on both temperature and heat. All right, uh, this obviously has uh, greater thermal energy or more heat content in there. Now, one way that uh, campers can keep warm when they're camping in the wintertime or on top of snow, like in the mountains when it's like January or something, is to take some water, boil it on their uh, camp stove and then transfer it to a very durable rubber bag and they cap that up. And then when they're ready to go to sleep at night, they pull it into their sleeping bag and they hold it next to their, their torso, their body, or maybe in between their legs or something, somewhere where they feel cold, okay? And during the night, uh, this heat is transferred and released to um, your body, keeping you a little bit more comfortable during the night, okay? And obviously, um, that's going to be more likely to occur. There's more energy or more heat or more thermal warmth if you have a greater amount of water, okay? If you just put a few drops of water in that bag, it's gonna cool down very quickly and go away and it's not really gonna keep you warm through the night. But if you have a very large bag, like one liter or two liters, for example, then that's gonna keep you, it's gonna cool more slowly and it seems like it lasts longer and it releases a lot more heat you know, through the night. So that's another example or application of this, okay? All right. Now, um, this heat or thermal energy is sometimes defined as internal energy. Internal energy is the total kinetic energy and potential energy of the individual molecules of the object, okay? 
And so kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and it's very complicated because you have vibration, uh, translation, and then you have rotation. And a molecule can be doing uh, more than one of these things at a time, okay? Now heat is oftentimes used to transfer energy. We talked previously about transferring biochemical energy in our bodies into uh, heat. We spend the effort to rub our hands together and then um, that gets converted into uh, a warm feeling in our hands. Okay, that's a transfer of energy. Okay. Uh, there's many other things that happen here um, when, you heat, when you heat objects up, okay? Um, So heat is the measure of the internal energy that has been absorbed or transferred from one body to another. So heat never has, heat is never defined in terms of just itself. It's always a transfer, okay? Um, and it's important to realize that heat and transfer always kind of go together, okay? So I can't really say my, my hands are warm I have to know how to compare that to another thing, okay? So let me simplify this without the mathematical jumbo and just talk about how does a mom figure out if their kid has a fever? They put their hand on their forehead and then they feel something, okay? And what does this person or the parent or the mom feel? They feel uh, warm or cold, okay? If their hand feels warm, what does that mean? Okay, so here's the hand. Here's the forehead. If their child feels warm, it means that heat is transferring from the forehead to their hand, which means that the forehead is warmer than their hand because heat always travels to a cooler object. That's very a uh, fundamental rule. Heat always travels from hot to cold, okay? It goes from hot to cold. So it goes to a cooler object. So if you touch somebody's forehead, not your own, but somebody else's forehead, and that person feels warm or hot, their, their forehead feels hot, what's happening is that heat is transferring from their forehead to your hand, which is cooler, and that sensation is the sensation of hotness. And so you conclude that, oh, you have a fever. Um, let's go to the doctor, let's stay home from school or whatever, okay? You're getting sick or something. Now, if you touch somebody's forehead and it feels cold, it means your hand is hot, their forehead is cooler, and heat is transferring from your hand to their uh, body, okay? And what happens if you touch somebody and you feel nothing? It just feels warm. Well your hand would feel the same as their body temperature, and that would be just like you're not even touching them. You wouldn't sense any kind of heat transfer, okay? So when you're detecting somebody's fever, putting your hand on somebody's forehead, you're actually detecting heat flow, okay? And that's literally how we measure the amount of heat in a substance um, in the lab, okay? We measure heat flow. We heat something up, we cool something down, we catch it on fire and we measure how much heat is produced, released, absorbed, all that kind of stuff, okay? You can't just look at an object, stick a thermometer in there and then see, you know, how much heat is in there. We also have to compare it with something else, okay? Now, what we are going to be looking for is a temperature difference, okay? When a temperature difference occurs, 
energy is transferred from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature, okay? Energy flows from uh, a hot heated up oven to a cold pot of water, okay? So here's your, here's your, um, we'll do a stove. I don't know why I said oven, but here's your uh, heated up oven range. It's nice and red hot. And then here's a pot, okay? And there's some water in there, okay? And so heat's gonna flow from the hot oven to the cold water in the pot, okay? I'm not sure if you can see that little drawing there well, okay? And that's the natural process. That's the natural way heat flows, okay? Heat's always transferred from hot to cold, okay? And we have these vocabulary words called heating and cooling, okay? Heating. is when an object uh, gets warmer, it's absorbing heat. Temperature rises. But you're absorbing that heat from something else. There's a fire uh, producing that heat. Maybe there's something you plugged into the wall like a blow dryer hair dryer that's producing that heat. And then we have cooling. Cooling is releasing heat. Temperature drops. Where is that heat being released? It's not disappearing, it's being transferred to something else that's cooler, okay? So we talked about the analogy of a hot water bag in somebody's sleeping bag when they're camping in the winter. That hot water is cooling down, right? In the morning it might be, you know, room temperature or something or your body temperature. Where is that heat going? It's transferring to you, okay? If that hot water is hotter than your body temperature or higher in temperature than your body temperature, it can release some of that heat to your own body and it relieves your strain in your body trying to keep your body warm okay so heating and cooling be familiar with those terms heat's not created heat is not disappearing it's transferring always okay when you heat something up the heat is coming from outside to the object when you're cooling something down the heat is starting from the object and going to the outside, either the countertop or the air or something that's touching it, okay? So heat is always a transfer of energy, okay? Or thermal energy, if you like to call it that, okay? Now we have different measures of heat. Now, again, we call this thermal energy, so it's going to be the same energy um, units that we've seen before in the class. First, we'll talk about the metric unit, which is called the calorie. Calorie is spelled C-A-L-O-R-I-E or abbreviated small c a l and we're familiar with the food calorie but actually it's a little bit different than this and i'll get into this but a calorie is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water exactly one degree celsius So one gram of water is very small and one degree Celsius is very small, but 
uh, if I were to put one gram of water on my hand and it were to warm up from, you know, 31 degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius, that would be one degree Celsius higher, and that's one gram of water. The amount of heat needed to do that would be a calorie. Where does that heat come from? My hand, right? Which is warmer. So that's a calorie. A kilocalorie is abbreviated KCAL, K-C-A-L. Okay, and it's the amount of heat ne needed to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, K means uh, kilo, right? So instead of uh, one gram, it's going to be one kilogram. All right, so it's just a thousand calories. All right, so that's a thousand calories. Um, we also have things uh, like British thermal units or BTUs. Uh, I'm not gonna write out what that stands for. So that's British thermal unit. And um, it's, it's, it's again, an English unit, a British unit, right? It's the amount of energy or heat needed to increase the temperature of one pound of water one degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Uh, BTU is commonly used in heating or cooling rates of furnaces and air conditioners and water heaters and things like that, okay? Um, and the rate is usually understood to be a BTU per hour, okay? So, and it goes on from there. So your heater might have a certain rating or heat rating on there. And of course, you don't want to use a small, tiny heater to heat your whole house. You want to have the appropriate sized heater. So those people in HVAC, they have all these tables and calculations and things like that to determine what's an appropriate sized heater for your square footage of house, okay? And uh, it also depends on the environment. Okay, if you're in um, a temperate zone where it doesn't get super hot or cold during the um, winter and summer, you know, you're not gonna need such a powerful heater, but um, we won't get into, into all of that. That's a different class, okay, that I don't teach. All right, uh, what is a metric unit? Calorie, kilocalorie, BTU, these are the English units. We have something called the joule. Joule is J-O-U-L-E, capital J. And this is the metric unit of energy. That's what they would use from everything from atomic bombs to supernovas to uh, vibrational states of atoms and uh, a, hot cup, a hot cup of coffee, for example, okay? So this is what we're going to be use, using. Now, we don't have a, this nice cool definition like the calorie. But uh, what we need to say is that one joule, uh, 4.184 joules is equal to one calorie, okay? So if I were to tell you I had something with 10 calories, that'd be, you know, around 41.84 joules, okay? So that's the uh, metric unit there, okay? Now, uh, I think I'll stop this video here a little early, and we'll talk about uh, calculating the amount of energy needed to warm something up or cool something down uh, in the next lecture. So we've, re we've talked about a lot. Please uh, review, write down, take notes, all these definitions so that it will help you um, uh, study. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.